in our study of the ongoing uh, person and work of the Holy Spirit. And today is Communion Sunday, so we'll be doing that as well. So let's, uh, let's bow and pray, and we'll get started on our, our lesson for today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have, as always, um, to come before you. Thank you for being uh, always our God and our Father and our Savior and coming bridegroom who always watches over us, cares for us, and you have told us you will not leave us orphans, and you've sent us the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for this ongoing understanding of your role that you play in our lives, and how you are still with us, and in ways that we just really got to understand more and better, and, and, and more clearly how, again, you continue to help, guide, direct, and just always uh, be alongside of us, and within us, uh, to help us do what is right, to help us think understand what is right, to understand your ways and not our ways, and your thoughts not ours, so help us to change our thoughts, help us to change our ways, to align with you, knowing that we've never arrived and never will arrive at the right mindset or the right deeds, but always pursuing being better, always pursuing to be transformed in the image of you. So, Father, we thank you for your constant uh, work as the, pot, as the potter over us, as the clay, break and mold and reshape us. Be with us now in the teaching ongoing of the person and work of the Holy Spirit as you would guide, direct, enlighten, and share with us more truth of your understanding to us so it's applicable and how we need to understand it. Do with each and every one throughout the ministry as we need to cry out to you for our needs of, of physical, financial, mental, emotional, spiritual growth and needs of healing and provision. We know that you know all these things. We ask you to continue to guide us and direct us to just trust you regardless of the results in the process of looking to you will be changed by just trusting in you. So be with us now as our counselor, our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our, our shepherd. We ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we start, is Leon online still the only one? Well, hello, Lee, Tracy, and Vicki. All right, so <clears throat> as we are continuing our study, uh, this is our ongoing lesson of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So as we go through this study today, uh, I want to just continue to remind us of some uh, review that we did already and in reference to what we talked about in, in reference to the Holy Spirit. So first of all, one thing we didn't really emphasize that I wanted to write on the board is just don't forget in Psalm 51, David talked about restoring or renewing or repairing his, his joy of his salvation by renewing his spirit, re restoring his spirit. Because remember, the spirit of man is dead and from the Garden of Eden. And so Christ made our spirit alive again. Only Christ can do that through the Holy Spirit uh, being in us. And so it's interesting how he's crying out for a reparation, for repairing and restoring his spirit. He means within the confines of knowing that it's dead, the only way to restore and repair God's spirit to men back then was to have them be uh, aligned with the Holy Spirit, telling them what to do, having them align with the law of Moses and obeying those righteousness. Uh, that's why in Titus he says, not by works of righteousness we've done that he saved us, but by his work. So, and the, rea the reality about what David said, though, he said in John Psalm 51, 12, he said, restore the joy of my salvation. So we tend to forget that. That means that people who always make fun of me and say, well, how do you, how do you have a salvation when you're not in Christ? How, how is that possible? <laughs> David said it. David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation, Psalm 51, 12. We read it last week. So we kind of didn't emphasize that, but it's a big deal because it really solidifies the fact that there is a salvation prior to being in Christ. I didn't write the book. You can't tell me that Christ had lived and died and rose again from the dead in Psalm 51. He had not done that yet. So David, to say that, being a person of covenant, he's showing you that a salvation of knowing who the one true God is is what he's talking about. Walking in the blessing and the righteousness of God's blessings in his life. So that's, again, a nice takeaway for those who don't want to understand or agree there's more than one salvation. There's evidence right there. If you don't even want to understand the Greek words that have plural in them in the New Testament, understand and explain to me what David's talking about then. He's obviously not talking about in Christ. Yeah. Oh. Well, they're saying, well, they, that would, they, they would say he's talking about a future salvation, but he said restore to me a salvation means he already had it. He's talking about the salvation he had. He feels a salvation when Christ, when his spirit, his Holy Spirit, excuse me, is in his life constantly reminding him of the righteous acts and deeds to do. That's what he's talking about. He's, in other words, their salvation, like our Pentecostal friends, 
is likened unto our other salvations where we have the ongoing work of God in our life where if we do what's right, we experience salvation, plural. But if we don't, we lose those salvations. And that's kind of confusing for people to hear me for the first time. But remember, in your chart, there's the first salvation, second salvation, you don't lose. Once you have it, you have it. But the, the, the joy of that salvation, he's asking to be restored, it wasn't salvation itself, it was the joy of it, because he had the salvation, it was the joy of it that he was missing and losing because of his lack of righteous obedience to the law of Moses and to God. So he's not referring to a future salvation. He said restore the joy, which means he had it and he lost it. So that's what he said. So, so you have this joy he's talking about. So he already had a salvation that was of covenant. And those two salvations of covenant and testament you can't lose. But the other four in between, as we know, you can gain and lose them, which is it. Correct. That's my whole point. And people just don't, they don't want to see that, which I'm like, how could you ignore Psalm 51 as well? He said that. But they'll, people will say, well, I'm talking out of my, 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 my second mouth over here or something like that. Uh, I'm talking out of, your, out of school and you're saying it's more than one salvation, but it's clearly understandable when you read Psalm 51 12. So. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the salvation they incurred was similar to us. They had two tiers. They had be a breathless or nepios. Just be of the Jewish covenant is one thing but then to act in circumcision of your spirit, of your heart, is different. So to be a, of covenant, God gives you a blessing no matter what of covenant. But then when you want to collaborate with him in obedience, you have a Nepios relationship, which then gets you to Abraham's bosom. That's the difference. So just like with us, you can be in Christ, but you can live in obedience with him. There's two different tiers of what that looks like. And we act like it's no big deal. It's no different than it is now, just it's just more details involved than it was. Same principle, more details involved. But they don't, no one wants to see that. But that's what it is. You see that in Scripture all day long. But that's a side note because I want to make sure we remind ourselves how when they were in the garden and the Holy Spirit was inside of the man and woman, they were flesh and bone, no blood. They were animated by the Spirit of God. And so therefore you have to understand that's why when Jesus rose from the dead and he then had a body of flesh and bone and said, touch me, I have flesh and bone, they, he was restoring to our bodies the animation of the Spirit within us that was intended from the beginning so the holy spirit was the intentional understanding of the life force of the life in us as god had said it in genesis 2 7 when he breathed into us his ruach the wa ruach when he when he breathed into us his wa ruach the the spirit of god the father the holy spirit made us into a living soul and it was god's spirit that animated us not our blood his spirit gave us life interesting though that he tells moses that life's in the blood thereof well yeah post sin before sin our life was in his spirit you have to understand that so if you lose that you're going to lose the understanding of the gravity of the person and work of the holy spirit he is the one that gives us life so when people say that the bible's not enough or the word of god's not enough then you're you don't under, you're not understanding who the person and work of the holy spirit is you don't understand when Jesus was talking about through the writer of Barnabas of the book of Hebrews, which we've talked about, when he said the word of God is alive and powerful and has life breathing. It's God breathed Timothy. He's got Paul right to Timothy. So it, it's, it's not just a book. It's a breathing, living book that the Lord, through his spirit, is breathing into us life. So if you knew that you had a lung issue in COPD and you knew that you had a hard time breathing and you knew you needed oxygen, you're low on oxygen, how much more would you gravitate toward the oxygen mask? because you need to and because you want to that's what the bible is supposed to be to us and and it's because we have life in our blood that deceives us to think oh i have life but is that life permanent no with blood comes death so why are you depending on the fact that it's a deceive it's a deceit that's what satan wants you to be deceived by this was the issue that satan told him in the garden of eden you don't you need to do, god didn't want you the true you need knowledge of good and evil because you'll know uh, good and evil and be like him no 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 what he was trying to lie to us about was what he discovered himself, which was being a sinless celestial, the only cherub that covereth, as we talked about him, this makes good reference point. He knew what it was like to have the knowledge of, of good and evil because he, understandably so, as a sinless being, with the knowledge of his beauty and God's wisdom he gave him and his ministry of praising God, that got to him. His beauty, God disposed, his glory disposed upon him to transmit to other people. It, it got to him. And so he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle the just, just just the knowledge of like, wow, I am the projection of God's glory to all these people. God's like on Joseph's coat of many colors, in essence. He just kind of trans, transmitted his glory 
through me to show everybody else his glory. I, my charge was to emanate that to other people. And yet he couldn't handle it, and he didn't like the first row in the house. He wanted to be God himself. So interesting, he had no scale of appreciation. We do, knowing him and other people, and yet he's trying to tell us, oh, you need God, good and evil. No, no, no. God's trying to let us know the reason why he said not to eat of the tree, a good and evil, or in this case to lie with Satan in that case. Don't believe him. Because just like him, he's a celestial who was sinless. He couldn't handle. Just having my glory. Trust me, you as a non-celestial cannot, cannot, cannot handle the knowledge of good and evil without doing evil. Even as a sinless being. You can't. You can't do it. That's what the Lord was saying to us. Celestial anointed cherub that covereth fell and became Satan. And he, as a being that I imputed my glory unto, couldn't handle that, and he fell into sin. What chance do you have being sinless, knowing good and evil, and not sinning? Not going to happen. You're going to sin. And that's why Satan's like, oh, I know you will, because if I sinned, and I, ha I had all the glory imputed unto me, and I was sinless, and I was celestial, you got no shot of knowing good and evil and not sinning, because you're a human being. You're not a celestial. So he wanted them to have the same... He wanted the same joy, if you will, misery loves company, if you will. He wanted to see us be destroyed from the inside out and be stripped of the same thing he was stripped of, God's presence in his life, on him, within him. He was just emanating with, <laughs> he loves to see us. You know, when someone else has like a, a pain or injury come to them, they want someone else to have that same pain or injury. That was what Satan's diabolical mindset was. He wanted to ensure that we experience the same pain, the same agony, the same loss, the same separation from God that he had, ha, 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 he wins. And that was his whole thing with the Holy Spirit being in us and on us. He knew that God, his presence was within him, emanating through him, and he lost all of that. Lost his form and visage, made to ash, and he was embarrassed. He was pummeled by God in front of everybody to see. He was embarrassed. So that's why he wanted to embarrass the woman and then the man in front of God himself when he goes, why, why, how do you know you're naked? And he goes, well, it's the woman. Da, 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 da. That wasn't the point. The point is, how do you know you're naked? And, and God's pointing out, you see, that's what sin does. When the Holy Spirit's not in us, and when he's no longer on us, we begin to start pointing fingers. Which means that I don't care who did what to you, how, how something happened unto you, just stop. You're a sinner. That's why you sinned. That's the answer. Not, well, he's a butthead. They're a jerk. They're, they're an exploitative, you know, sinner you sin because you're a sinner other sinners do things to you that make it worse i get it other sinners do things to you that that are un, that are not right i get it god's asking you the question but why do you sin and what do we always do my mom did this my dad did that my husband did this my kid did that the boss did this the person on the highway did that stop you're a sinner that's why you sin that's why satan wants us to lie to ourselves and believe what he told them what he didn't have to say anything that's the knowledge of good and evil. What it does, it gets us to go, well, it's, it, if I was not, uh, just stop. If I was not, are you a sinner? Yes or no? That's how you know you're naked because you no longer are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You no longer have God's presence on your life. And that's how you know you're naked. That was the answer to the question, man, the man, which we call Adam. The man was supposed to say that. But no, he said, oh, it's the woman you gave me. Stop with the excuses. Yes, he, she, she was deceived and she fell. Yes, you did your obedient act to redeem her. I get all that. But how, that wasn't the question. It wasn't, it wasn't why did you partake of the fruit? That wasn't the question. How do you know you're naked? Genesis 3, 7. The answer should have been, because I'm now a sinner. That's how I know. Well, how, how do you know that? Because the Spirit of God left him. I think he knows that. Yes, he does know that. Because he saw her and saw it, and he experienced it himself. He saw it first. Unlike her, she didn't see that. He saw her without the Spirit of God in her and on her. Then he experienced it, and he had the audacity to act like, I don't know what's happening. Yes, you do. You know exactly what's happened. You're a sinner. And that's the thing that we have to come to grips with when the Holy Spirit is in our life, on us and in us. Then one of the evidences is that you're quickly, easily, without a problem, without hesitation, easily able to accept responsibility and accountability for yourself. If you continue to deflect on other people and continue to make excuses for how you think and how you live and how you blah, 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 then you're doing nothing differently than what Satan wants us to do, which is to continue what he did back in the Garden of Eden. When God asked the question, why do you sin? The answer is easy, because you're a sinner. Just repeat with me now. Why does anybody sin? Because we're sinners. That's the answer. How do we know we're naked? 
That's the question, right? Because we sinned. Because I'm a sinner. That's how I know. So that's the answer. But the Holy Spirit is the one who's convicting us of that and showing us that. So when we're in denial of that, that's the evidence that we're grieving him. So if you're in denial about your being a sinner, if you're in denial about, well, I don't care who did what, I don't care. The, the fact that what you think, what you do, how you do it, the struggles that you have, that's all on you. Because give it before God. Because if you struggle with it, that's on you. That's all you. And Satan wants to lie to you by going, but I have knowledge of good and evil. I know. He uses that against you. to go, but they are evil, though. Yeah, I know. They did exploit you. I understand. They did abuse you. I know. God's going, I know all that. But how you respond to it is all you. All you. 100% you. And you're like, yeah, but they didn't make it easy. I understand that. But it's all you. And that's the thing that we, as the early part of humanity, even when the first seed of sin was beginning to take root in us, even at the beginning, when sin didn't have its full thousands of years of growth in us, at the very beginning, that was the first reaction we had, was to go, I'm not going to acknowledge I'm a sinner. Oh, 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 no, 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 I can't deal with that. that, that guilt trip. Well, too bad. Acknowledge it. And Satan wants to play on us by saying, oh, I want to make you feel ashamed. And God's like, no, not shame. I want you to be convicted of your guilt, of your sin, for the purpose of knowing you need restoration, to turn to rely on me. That's what I want you to do. And Satan goes, I want to take that guilt, and I want to, I want to amplify it into shame to make you feel depressed, so then you could say, I don't want to be depressed. I want to, I want to love myself. How do I do that? Blame other people. What? Justify other things. I'm, no, I'm really not that bad. No, you are that bad. You're a sinner. So there's no such thing as, there's, there's, all, there's good in people. No, there's not. No, there's not. Nice try. No, there's not. In Christ, you have some good infused into you, but you have no good in you when you're born and when you're conceived. It ain't happening. So anyway, that's a little side note. Yeah, man looks on the Yeah, there's man yeah, man looks on the outward appearance. And that's why even to this day people always say about those that they, they shame how people's bodies look and what the what she, there's always this men and women expectation of each other, how we're supposed to look and men have expectations of women, women have expectations of men, more so men. And I, I just recently heard about a um a, 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 they said about when it comes to the physical visage, women use imagination more and men use visual more. From which to in other words, a women Women like to understand what, it, what they want it to look like, what it should look like to them, and that's what makes them excitable or desirable to imagine what that man should look like, whereas a man wants to see it. They are, they're visual, they said. Men are more visual. They want to see it. They can't. It's not their imagination of what their perfect woman looks like, if you will. It's what they visually see, and they kind of amalgamate that together, whereas a woman builds it in their mind. So they, in other words, that takes more, obviously, uh, astute <laughs> intelligence to do that men are more simpletons <laughs> so it's just one of those things where it's interesting that psychology has pointed that out but it all speaks to again the the, the shame that we all have because whether it's in your mind or what you think it should look like or whether it's in your visual what you have predetermined what it should look like we're all still subjected to the, the sinful nature of having this shame when we don't measure up to what we think it should be or what we see it should be and it's just a, it's, a, it's not right and God doesn't want that it's not what God that's what Satan wants not what God wants and when the Spirit is within us, when the Holy Spirit's in us, dwelling in us, as he was in the Garden of Eden and on us, then we see we're able to be used by God and, and we're able to be understanding to walk with God as he is transforming our minds. So that's one of the things I want to remind us of about how it all started and the Holy Spirit's role in that. And then just remember that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit was, he's also at the review, he's always moving, and he was the voice of the Lord God or, or the Lord in the Old Testament. So that means that when he... He, he, when God he says God spoke, that's one thing. But when they said that phrasing, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord God, that was the Holy Spirit talking to them. And that's why in the Garden of Eden, when the voice of the Lord called out to them, we saw about that before, it just was like a chill of like, wait a minute, that voice was internal before, and now it's external. Just, it's just a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling. It's like waking up and, and always waking up next to the one you love, and then all of a sudden, you, you no longer, you're hearing them on a, on a voice recording now. I have voice recordings of, I'm sure you do too, of people that you've lost and you've loved. People that have died. I have voice recordings. It's not the same thing when they're right in front of you, but it does, I don't know about you, but it does bring a different type of chill to you, to your understanding of like, wow, I hear that person's voice who I love, and it brings back memories, but it's, you know distinctly and uniquely it's not the same as them being in your presence, right? That's what the man and woman were experiencing in the Garden of Eden. They were experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit within them, all of a sudden had left and they felt ashamed and they felt naked knew they were naked felt ashamed 
but all of a sudden when God's voice called out, which is the Holy Spirit, then they were like, whoa, that is eerie. I don't know what that feeling is. The feeling I have of not having him with me and in me is different, communing with me. Now he's talking from the outside in. This is really weird. They were, they were just taken aback by him. And just imagine what that would be like throughout the whole Old Testament. So we talked about how the Holy Spirit continues to move. He would lift people, carry people, lead people, teach people. We talked about in the book of Daniel, he gave him an excellent wisdom, an excellent spirit, even though he also talked about there's ongoing wisdom, plural. So the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom of the Word of God. And then another ongoing wisdom within the secret of the, of the kingdom of the God. So there's wisdom, the plural. So can you be a wise man or woman who does not know mysteries and secrets? Yes. But can you be wise in all of the scripture, which is just, just knowing the sporos of the word of God? No. You have to know the word of the Lord, which is, which is a seed within a seed, the secrets and mysteries God, Christ said in Matthew 13, verse 11, which were privileges given unto people that he determines. Not that you earned it or you deserved it or you strove for it. No, God just gave it to you. So he imparts as he wants. So now we're, and that's the kind of a summation we talked about so far, the Holy Spirit. Of course, he is not to mention God, the Holy Spirit, part of the Godhead, the facilitator. But these are some of the takeaways. But now I want to focus in on some of the other work of the Holy Spirit from the New Testament perspective. And as God wills it, we'll see. We're going to go at least another two lessons, maybe three on this. But I can tell you that there's, lot, there's so much to talk about with the Holy Spirit. So now we're in the New Testament part. People always would say, well, Holy Spirit didn't come as relevance to us until until Jesus lived and died and rose again from the dead because Jesus said it's more profitable for you that, that, that I go because then the helper will then come to you. And if I don't go, then he, he won't come. So therefore, they, they would, people they'd put together, well, that means he wasn't ever here and therefore, he's the first time happening post-resurrection. It's not really reality. That's a misunderstanding of what Jesus is talking about. And so when Jesus is here, he's the Godhead incarnate. And remember, and Jesus, when he talked about, I wrote on the board, he talks about how the Holy Spirit teaches and reminds us of his teaching. And he says that the, the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father, but it's through the Son. Now watch this. Go to John 14, 26. Go to John 14, 26. John 14, 26. He says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, by the way, is parakletos. Para means alongside. Kletos means to call. So it's, he's called to be alongside us. The Father, he's from the Father, which, by the way, it says from, we're going to see, see, this, see this later on in the Scripture. He's para, from the Father. He's alongside the Father. But he's also, as we'll see, he's also, he's come out from, he's ekporumai, he's, out, he's come out from the Father as well, which is why I always say the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father. He's alongside the Father, but he's also out from the Father. Just like, Jesus in John 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God Meaning he's the only God there ever is and was that's the anarthros the a article a Jesus God the son was with God the father and he is God the father. You're like wait what? Holy Spirit's no different. He's part of the Godhead But he's telling you that he actually is out from God it, That's not said of from Jesus. That's different. So this is different. So when you go to John 14, 26, he says, but the helper, the parakletos, the come alongside called one, the, the, he's called to come alongside of us to be our advocate. It's the word we use for advocate. He's, he speaks for us. He's our advocate. So think about this. We have one mediator and we got one advocate. So it's interesting how we think that Christ is the advocate because of the scripture in Timothy where he has a mediator between God and man. The judge is the one who mediates the determination of the court proceeding, does he not? Does the lawyer just do what they want as your advocate? No! The lawyer is under the confines of what the judge tells him or her what to say. We meaning, not what to say, but controls what they can say and what they can say. They'll say, a counselor, they'll stop them if they're going off, off kilter, they'll stop them if they're you know, committing things against the, the court's um, rulings that you can't just like approach any way you want and just start making statements. He's going to say, stop, ask your question. The judge can, can, can easily do that. The judge is the mediator, right? So Jesus is the judge in Matthew 28. All judgment is given under the sun. All under the, under the sun. He's the judge. He's the mediator. 
our advocate, our, our attorney in the courtroom of the judgment of God the Son is God the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. How cool is that? We have a righteous judge and God, and, and God the Son who's overseeing us to make sure that the determination is going to be righteous and just and, and forthright. And we have the Holy Spirit who's advocating for us to present the best case possible in our sinful depravity of our life in its holistic view before the judge. Thank you very much, God. You, <laughs> you know I'm going to be uh, uh, constantly having failure experiences, but you've given me an advocate to speak for me to present my case in the best truthful narrative presentation possible. Thank God. We have the best lawyer you say money can buy. We have the best lawyer you can imagine on your side. When it comes to, you know, I always think about that as a, as a memory. It helps me because if I say, Ghost of Ice, if I died today, I, if I, God takes me right now, I, I don't know. There's always that, that Paul sense of, I'm chief among sinners. I, I don't know. Whenever, whenever it washes out, it washes out. There's always that contriteness and brokenness. But at the same time, there's that sense of confidence. And, and that's why he says approach to the throne of confidence, the throne of grace of confidence. Because we have an advocate who's going to give us the best presentation, the best narrative on the basis of the truth. He's not going to lie. He's not going to massage things. He's going to give us the best opportunity to be seen for the truth of who we are, our intentions, our motives, our, our flaws, all in context of holistic, only on the way he can do. How awesome is this? So the, but the helper of the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, which the Father will send in my name. You see, the Father sends him through Christ. So important to understand this. So he says, the Father sends the Holy Spirit through Christ in my name. He shall teach you all things, this is John 14, 26, and remind you all things which I said to you. So here's the question. Folks who say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where, where, where should we go to eat? Wait a minute, stop. We should go eat at this place over here because I see a woman. The Holy Spirit just told me, woman's going to have a, uh, have a heart attack and I'm going to be there to help call the, call the ambulance. Stop lying! It's not what Jesus said, is it? Did he talk about a woman having a heart attack in a restaurant in, in, the, year, in the year 2022? No. So stop lying. The Holy Spirit told me that. Stop. You're lying. You're a liar. The Spirit teaches and reminds you of what Christ said, which is in the book, right? So every time someone says, the Spirit told me, told you what? He better tell you something that, that, that's relative to what the book, the Scripture says, or else you're lying, Right? That's why, that's, why, that's why Peter said, stop lying to the Holy Spirit. I didn't say it. Peter said it. In other words, if you're saying the Spirit led you, then what you're saying and what you're doing should align with the scriptural truth. And if it doesn't, you're a liar. Boom. End of conversation. Full stop. There's no like, but, 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 I don't care how you think, how you feel, what you, I don't care what the crowd says, what the majority, yeah, it's still a lie. Does it testify of the writings that the apostles wrote about the words of the teachings of Christ? Does it speak to the Scripture? And since Jesus is the living Word of God, the entire Word of God is the teaching of Jesus, some indirectly through prophets, some directly through his own mouth, and directly through the apostles. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. The entire, it doesn't contain God's Word. The entire Scripture is God's Word. So the Holy Spirit speaking in and through you and teaching and reminding you Prove it. Prove it. What verse? And you go, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't really know. Then, then it's not him. Sorry. Sorry, that's ridiculous. How can he? So you're telling me the Holy Spirit's going to teach you and remind you of something that you have Alzheimer's about as soon as I ask you, what, what did he teach you and remind you of? I don't know, but I know it was true. How do you know that then? How do you know it's true if you can't go back to some reference of what Scripture has to say about the matter that you claim God illuminated you to the, the Scripture from which you don't know what that scripture was. That makes no sense. That makes no sense at all. It's like going to a JoJo. Oh, oh, but Brother Lee, Master Lee taught me this move to defend myself. What move? I don't know, but it's to defend myself. Then you don't, then you didn't, either you're lying or you didn't learn it. I don't know what's going on here. You got some serious problems, right? Something ain't right. It doesn't match up. So as Jesus says clearly in John 14, 26, that the helper, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, the Father sends him and he, through his, in his name, he shall teach, it's his, his teach remember what it says back in deuteronomy remember this the lord is going to actually if i erase it on the phone in deuteronomy and chapter in chapter 4 33 and 36 holy spirit speaks to teach us new skill sets to learn of god and his word that's what it says teach us new skill sets that was his reason for speaking and what a coincidence jesus doesn't change his role and responsibility 
The Holy Spirit, he says, is going to teach us and remind us of the things which he said, Jesus said. That's John 14, 26. Then go over also to John chapter 15. Now go to John 15, and you'll see in verse 26, where he says, John 15, 26, not John 14, but same verse, different chapter. John 15, verse 26. But when the helper comes, the parakletos, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you. Interesting. He says, I will send. He just said earlier that the Father sent him. Remember, he's not lying because Jesus is God. But he's talking about God, the Father will send him in my name. So Jesus is talking about, he comes through me. That's why Jesus could say, no one gets to the Father but through me. Just like this, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father but through him. To understand that. That's why you pray to the Father in Jesus' name. All he wants to make sure you understand is nothing happens apart and from and in and through him. Colossians made that statement to the Apostle Paul, right? He in him, all things consist. He holds all things together, all and by him, all things came into being. He, he's just letting you know, <laughs> okay? He, he, it all goes through him. So in John 15, 26, when the parakletos comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, you see, the word from is para, from alongside the Father, the spirit of the truth, the, sp the spirit of the truth will come forth. That word is ex porumai, which means to go out from. He goes out from. He will testify of me. So does, does the Holy Spirit t give testimony and witness to a frivolous ignorance? Oh, I saw the vision. Stop lying. He teaches and reminds you of what Jesus said, and he testifies to Jesus. So what's all this malarkey about, this garbage about, about... Oh, uh, Saul of Vision. What, what's that about? I don't understand what that's about. What, 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 uh, Saul of Vision of what? And what's the purpose of that? Because the Holy Spirit is supposed to remind us and teach us of what Christ already said past tense. So I'm trying to figure out what vision are you talking about? This isn't prophecy time. This isn't Ezekiel and Daniel time. This isn't the apostles time. They've already been all dead and gone. This is living word of God. Hebrews, this is what he says that, that, that he speaks to us now through his son so he says here he testifies of me verse 27 of john 15 and you also will testify because you are with me from the beginning then go to john 16 go to john 16 let's see also about the holy spirit in john 16 the holy spirit now we, we as we continue to build on this he's our parakletos he comes alongside us he, he's called by god the father he's from he's alongside the father he comes out from the Father through Christ to us. So the Father sends him through Christ and then sends him to us, which we're going to see that later on when he rose from the dead when he breathed on them. And we say to the Holy Spirit. Remember that? That was through him, right? That's why he said that. That's why he said, I send them to you. Because he did, right? But then he also calls in the book of Acts 1, 4, he says, wait in the upper room for the promise of the Father. The announced declaration. That's what a, that's the... That's the the promise of the, the announced declaration of the Father was that I was going to send you alongside of me, my spirit, that will come out from me through Christ, through God the Son, that will be given to you. In other words, without Christ living and dying and rising from the dead, you wouldn't have this promise. So yeah, it came from me, but it's through Christ. Without him doing, without God the Son doing what he did, you, you got no shot of the, Holy Spirit, of the promise of the Father being, in, being fulfilled. That's an announced declaration because now it has been fulfilled, and that's why Jesus said, Await for the realization of what you're about to have happen to you at Pentecost. Fifty days after Passover, of course. That was later on. Back to the book of John, chapter 16, and verse 7. He said, but I tell you the truth. Remember, he's the, he's the testify of the truth. He's the spirit of the truth. And remember, truth is scripture. Truth is God's word. And the truth is Christ, the living word. So truth is the written word. And the truth is the living word. Just like, just to understand this, for example, remember the article, the, in front of truth, when he says the spirit of the truth earlier in John 15, he's speaking of, he's, he's the spirit of God the Father. He's not just Christ, the spirit of Christ. He's the spirit of God the Father. And he is of the truth because he's testifying of the living truth, Christ. So truth is the written word. The truth is the living word. Just like in the book of Revelation, when he gave the Evercomers promise, he says, you have forsaken your first love, that's your protos love, because your Mia love is the word of God, which then leads you to your protos love of the living God. 
So the word of God leads you to the, the word of God, the written word, leads you to the living word of God in Christ. But people love the word of God so much and growing academia by it, they, they forsake their relationship with what the written word testifies of, which is the living word. The whole purpose of the written word is to get you to understand the living word of God Almighty, God the Son, Yeshua, Jesus. So when Jesus is talking about the spirit of the truth, he means he's the spirit that testifies of me. I'm the truth. Jesus said that. I'm the way, the truth, the life, right? He's the spirit of the truth. He testifies of the living word. So, John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. He is speaking again about himself. So he's speaking again about himself in verse 7. I tell you the truth. I'm talking about my... He's basically, he's basically, another way for him to say this is, I'm telling you about myself. Okay. Let me tell you about myself. So in verse 7 of John 16, he says, it, it, is, it is better or more profitable for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the helper, the parakletos, will not come to you. But if I will, but if I go, I will send him to you. Okay, wait a second. So he's supposed to teach us and remind us of, of these things, and he's supposed to testify of, of the living word. So he's teaching and reminding us of what Christ already said, and he's testifying within what Christ said, not about the academia of the word itself, but the teaching and reminding of how within the written word itself, understanding of all those dynamic details and all that knowledge, and all understanding, all the wisdom, understand the person of the living word of God, Christ himself. He's not to get you all academia built up in your brain cells and look what I know. He's not, no, no, no. It's about learning all that so that you can see Christ through it all. Then in verse, again, chapter 16, verse 7, he says, this is why if I don't go, I can't send them to you because trust me, you, you're not going to, in other words, in other words, we have to have Jesus live and die for us to pay our sin debt so that then only after he is alive, died, and rose again from the dead, he then can only then illuminate us. He has to first depart the word of God to us in teaching, then leave us so the Holy Spirit can then come back around and tutor us. So Jesus is basically telling you that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and our tutor. He's not just teaching us what to understand. He's also teaching us how and why it matters to us what jesus already said it's what he's talking it's what he's teaching us he's awesome holy spirit is an he's an awesome awesome role in our life as teacher and counselor yes sorry just a minute sorry everybody else frozen too Okay. Is it, is it unfrozen now, Lee? Does it work for you now? Just let me know if you, the video is unfrozen. Just say Y or N. Say Y for yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Just a minute. Let me just reset this. Let me just log out, log back in, guys. Okay. Just a minute. I'll be right back. How are we doing now? We good now? Is that good? There we go. Sorry about that. Sometimes we have some tech issues. From time to time it happens. Okay, so let me, let me help me understand. The Vicky's question is a good question. Why is the teaching of the Holy Spirit more preferred than the teaching of Christ? Here's why. It's going to sound interesting. This is going to sound weird when I say it this way. What Jesus taught is more important but it's when he taught. So when he taught, we didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. When he taught, we didn't have the enrobing of God's Spirit on us. So when he taught, we were still lacking in the ability to understand. So the Holy Spirit teaches nothing new to us other than he's expounding on what Christ already taught. So he's not teaching it. Jesus is the one who taught new things and expounded upon what the Old Testament was writing about. And he added things, he added information and knowledge to that. 
he stacked up the knowledge. Holy Spirit just takes from that knowledge and that wisdom Jesus had done as God the Son, and he's expounding that for us. He's just putting forth how it all makes sense together. But the Holy Spirit is preferably understandable how he's the, he's the prime teacher because he's using the teaching of Christ, which is where the, the root, the, sp- the teaching of Christ represents the written word, which of itself has depth of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. But without a spirit made alive, what good is that? You, you can't understand that. Like when the apostles were told the parables in Matthew 13. Do you understand these things? Yeah, we do, Lord. No, they didn't. And later on, they were confused, remember? He even told them before his... We talked about this earlier this year. We always do every year about the, uh, the Easter time when he tells them a week before he's about to get crucified. Okay, he tells them multiple times. I'm, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Um, they're plotting against me and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, um, crucify me. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. Oh, no, it's not going to happen. Why did they say that? Because they were told the truth. He was teaching the truth. He was teaching knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. They didn't understand it. They, they, it didn't resonate with them. They only heard through a limited mindset of the finite depravity of a man the holy spirit then comes alive within us and he comes on us and he expounds for us he's like that teacher and tutor that we all wish we had when you had that class that the 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 the, the math teacher or the physics teacher or that english teacher sometimes you, you're learning you're like i don't understand <laughs> right imagine having as the teacher's teaching someone alongside of you is giving you the the, the 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 play-by-play of how to understand it how nice is that before you're just when christ was teaching he's like this high high up teacher and we're like I, I have no clue what you're saying I, I hear what you're saying I'm getting I'm catching some of it it's not Jesus's fault it's our inability to connect with his spiritual truth the spiritual truth is so mag it's so magnificent that depraved mind can't can't gather it in so Holy Spirit then awakens our mind he, 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 he quickens us and he awakens our spirit and now he's on us and in us and now we can understand he becomes our teacher and tutor to expound on what Christ already taught I hope that answers your question it's a great question but it's not the Holy Spirit's better than Christ. He's not. He's just the preferable uh, emphasis of who teaches us because when Jesus taught us, he taught the magnitude of what the Holy Spirit's using. He wrote the text, right? So the living word is the text, right? But the Holy Spirit is the teacher. He expounds on what's been written and spoken by Christ because if it wasn't for him living in us, we wouldn't be able to understand. So that's what that's about. Well, then this is your question. So, um, and that's what this presence of the Holy Spirit's about, whereas the power of the Holy Spirit's different. We'll get to that just in a minute, but it'll go into more answering your question there. So, going back to John 16, verse 7, when he says, if I don't go away, then he won't come to you, but if I go, I'll, I'll send him. Then in verse 8, he says, and having come, he will convict the world concerning sin. Now, he's convicting the world, people of covenant. So, the Holy Spirit's main function, he said, would be to convict the people of covenant of sins plural the word sin is in plural at the left side of your margin in john 16 verse 8 he says the world's people of covenant his job is to convict them of their sins plural so therefore people say oh god comes he wants everybody to be saved no 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 holy spirit's job just like jesus came to save his people from their sins holy spirit why would it surprise you that the helper comes to convict people of the world the covenant people not just cosmos but the cosmos the people in the cosmos that are already his people, to convict them of their sins. What sins are those? Their sins of <laughs> rejecting him, their sins of piousness and relying on their, their arrogance of their righteousness following the law of Moses. Those are the biggest two chief sins they have. Getting pious with their un- unrighteous lives and thinking they could just punch a checklist and to forget the spirit of the law. And also combined with even worse, then led them to reject him in total. And he's going to convict them of these sins, among many other manifestations of those two crux of their sins. Their lacks of following God with a pure heart, and, they're, and they're because of that, their result in rejecting Christ as their Messiah. He's like, I'm going to convict you of that, John. I'm going to definitely convict you of that. And the word convict means he's, he's going to, again, have, and they're on the board here, so he's going he's to have a reprove, he's going to reprove and expose. He reproves and exposes. That's what the word convict means. He reproves and exposes your sin it's going to reprove you going to correct you on that and expose you for your for what you did was wrong so in verse 8 of john 16 having come he the holy spirit the helper the paracletos will convict reprove and he will expose the world the people of covenant concerning sins plural and concerning righteousness now concerning sins that's again the depravity of mankind specific to the jewish people it's going to show them 
you think you're righteous, you don't understand. The righteousness that you have is only righteousness I imputed to you through obeying the law of Moses, which in effect, you yourself didn't learn. I showed you that. That's the law of Moses is supposed to teach you was that you can't be righteous by just following laws. I impute to you righteousness because you followed laws. The laws itself don't make you righteous. They're like, wait, what? Yeah, you're depraved. You're a sinner. And they're like, they, they didn't get that. And then you rejected me. He's not talking to all mankind. He's just trying to show the depravity of mankind. Even within the Jewish people, it's, it's a mankind issue. They think it's they're, spe they're special versus all the rest of the Gentiles. He's like, you know, all mankind shares this problem. You're depraved. So then, here's the righteousness, and that's the need for sanctification. So when he says he, he convicts us of righteousness, he's reproving, and he is, again, exposing the need that we have for being sanctified. So when people act like, oh, I'm, I, I'm good. I don't need to grow and cry. My belief in God is doesn't, doesn't need to be like yours. Okay, okay, okay. So, <laughs> so you're saying you don't need to be set apart, consecrated for service and use for God? Since when does the creator, the creator not have access to the creation 24-7? Since when do you own something that can just go rogue and do what it wants? Does your finger detach from your hand and just start walking away? No, it's attached to your hand. Doesn't God refer to us as the body of Christ? Since when do you just have the right to go, I'm a foot, I'm a part of the body, I don't need to believe in the body the way you do. Okay, fine, that's fine. But you're still part of the body. And you do are, therefore, are subject to the head, who is Christ. You have to see your head. You need to be set apart for the service of, for the answering to your creator. That's what the Holy Spirit is to convict you of, to make you realize, don't be an idiot. Don't be ignorant and say, oh, I don't, I don't believe in God like you do. It doesn't matter. Are you subject to God? Yes, you are. His, his job is to convict you, to reprove you, to expose you to the fact that you are subordinate to the head, to the creator, to your Savior. Then, after that, that, that requires sanctification or con with righteousness. Then he says, concerning judgment. Oh, I wonder what that's about. Concerning accountability. Why, is there, why would the Holy Spirit convict you of, of your sins? To let you know that you have to change. That you need a Savior. Why would the Holy Spirit convict you of righteousness? To know that being in Christ isn't enough to have good standing before God. You have to also collaborate with Him and, and, and add to your life righteousness. To be set apart to service for Him. Why would He convict you of judgment? To let you know you're accountable if you don't. It's not funny. So much for churchianity. Oh, you're good in Jesus' name. You're good. Then, then why is he convicting us of judgment then? I just want to know why that is. Why would he convict the people of covenant of judgment when it's referencing also that same principle of application there and samples and types for us? So if they're going to be convicted of their sins, of their need for righteousness, of their need for judgment, why would not we be as well, people in Testament? Of course we'd be. They're examples for us. They're types for us. And he even says, concerning sin, indeed because they believe not into me. Concerning righteousness, because I am going to my Father, and you behold me no more. I Meaning he's not going to be there to teach them anymore what to do what's right. They have to be told how to be set apart and service to God. Verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Ongoing judgment unto Satan, obviously, he's talking about. He's accountable for being the author and father of sin. But we're still accountable for being his children. He talked about that earlier in John 8. You're actually your father the devil, literally. Look in verse, 13, so in verse 12 and 13. I have yet many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. It goes back to Vicky's point. Teaching the Holy Spirit is because Jesus knows that all he's doing is imparting knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. But he knows that without a quickened spirit unto man, only when he provides it so, they'll be able to understand. Like he said to, to Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, you're, 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 the, you're, the, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. You're the Christ. And he says, flesh and blood didn't make this appearance. You, my Father in heaven, told you that. Because I know that. Because you're a dead spirit. You got no shot of understanding what I'm saying. So if you had said the right thing, it's because we, we, the God, had intervened. In this case, the Father told you. Where Jesus is saying here in John 16, 12, I can't say anything else to you. I've already told you enough information you don't understand. But the Holy Spirit, he will make sure he'll take what I said to you and he'll teach you what I meant by it. He'll remind you what I said and why I said it. He'll testify of the written words and the spoken words, how it, me how it mentions and testifies of me. Yeah. And he'll do all this, convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But I can't give you any. There's a lot I already gave you. I can't give you any more. You, you can't even bear it right now. 
verse 12 of John 16. Verse 13, but when he may come, you see the spirit, he, the spirit of truth, he will lead you. So we know he, so he teaches us, reminds us, testifies of Christ, convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, but he also leads us. He leads us, which means he is, is instructing us, he's guiding us. In what way? To, to, to do ignorant things, to justify our sinful actions, to, to justify how we should be bitter and angry and, and react in, a, in, a, in an uncordial way to our fellow man, to justify our, our relationship fractures and say, well, God's Spirit led me to do that, to key the car. Really, he did. He led you to actually burn, burn their clothes. Really? He, he, he led you, he did, 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 really? Liar! It says that God said he will lead you not to, into spite and bitterness and justification, He'll lead you into all the truth. So if you're led and God, guided by the Holy Spirit, as you claim that you are, people I know say this to me, I always say, okay, then here's the evidence of that. What, what, did you, what, new, dis- what new skill set, what new discipline did you learn about God and His Word? Please, pray tell. Well, I don't know the Bible like you. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't say that. I don't care if you do. What did God, through the Holy Spirit, lead you into understanding about the living Word of God? That's it. I don't care about me. I'm just a dork. You and God. You and God. Just you and Him. What did God teach you? How did He lead you and to guide you into the knowledge of who He is? That's the evidence. I, I just can't stand it when people lie, like Ananias and Sapphira did, but they got drop dead Fred. But now, since they don't drop dead, well, I can, get away. I can do it, and, and no one's going to know. God knows. And by the way, folks who know the Bible, like we're supposed to know, I know too. I know you're lying. I know you're lying because you're not matching up to what the scripture says. If you're led by God's spirit, then that means you're being led by into, into all the truth. That means that he is going to tell you about the living word. That means you should have something. If you're led and guided by the Holy Spirit and being instructed by him, then that means the instruction of him and the guidance of him is to inform you of the living word, Yeshua, Jesus. And if you know nothing about who he is and what he's done, nothing different, nothing more, nothing extraordinarily behind what you keep repeating to yourself, then, then you're lying to yourself. Which you, you're allowed to do that. Have fun. But don't lie to God. And I'm tired of you lying to me too. God's sick of it. I'm sick of it too. Don't, just stop. You're lying. You're lying. <laughs> it's, all, it's all a lie. Yes. <laughs> yep correct the spirit of the truth yeah, so he's talking about that's, his, that's one of his names he, the Holy Spirit is also one of his names he's, he's, he's the voice of the Lord he's the spirit of the truth he's the helper these are his names these are his names it's part of what it, so when he says he's the spirit of the truth he means that's one of his names in other words if the Holy Spirit is in your life then he's helping you in what way? He's a paracletos. He's called alongside of you. He's with you. If he's in your life, he's convicting you of sin and righteousness and judgment. If he's in your life, he's teaching and reminding you of Jesus, testifying of him. If he's in your life and, and he's actively engaged and you're actively engaging him, then he's actually leading you into more understanding of who Jesus is. So, for example, when someone says, I, I struggle with Jesus being God. I don't really understand. Uh, he's, uh, he's God the Son. And he's the same as Jesus. He's the same as God Almighty. Well, then... You can have those questions all you want. That's fine. I'll give you that. But then here's the thing you have to understand. Wait, wait. That means that you are not being led by the Holy Spirit when you say and think that. Fact statement. When you think that or say that, you are not being led by the Holy Spirit. That is impossible. Because his whole, his whole core being is to testify of the person and work of Christ and teachings of Christ. So don't lie to yourself when you teach things that are erroneous to Scripture. Purposely, knowingly, to get money, to get attention, to get power and control, or whatever the else, the acceptability, social structure, you're not being led by the Spirit of God. He'll lead you in all truth, for he will not speak from himself. He will speak whatever he may hear and declare to you the coming thing. So let me ask you this question. Why is it that people say, all the time to you and me i've heard it i'm sure you have if i've heard it all the time i'm sure you have too they'll say things like oh you know don't you have those moments where you're going through this and that and other and the spirit speaks to you 
and they'll start talking about some rudimentary, ignorant thing, and you're like, wait, what? But if you're speaking from yourself, from some wackadoodle occurrence you had with a relationship issue or when you were in a store and or whether the, the, the rainstorm came and as soon as you got in the car, it stopped raining and the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, look, I stopped the rain for you. All these different things that you say off the cuff, they're just wackadoodle things that just try to bring attention to yourself that you're so in touch with God's Spirit. When in fact, the Spirit doesn't speak for Himself. He speaks only on what Christ already said. So why is it you have the audacity to speak for Him haphazardly when He would never do that on behalf of Christ? He who is God, God Almighty is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit says, I will never arbitrarily speak rogue off, out of school, off the cuff. I'm always going to stay in, in, in the pocket of knowing what my role is, which is to, again, teach, remind you of what Christ said, testify who Christ is, continue to lead you into the guide and instruct you who Jesus is to the writings of Scripture. That's his job. Teach you new skill sets constantly. Teach you the how and the why and the what. And all of a sudden, we have this audacity to act like that's his role to stay in that, 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 <laughs> that lane. And we have this arrogance to say, we're just going to make up stuff and say, impute it to God's spirit told me. He would never do that. That's insulting to him. It's almost like when people who are Catholics and ex ex exalt the Virgin Mary as a god. If Virgin Mary was alive today or she was able to talk to us, she would be vomiting and disgust. She would say, no, I'm not a god. I am a sinner. I was a righteous woman chosen by God, favored by God, righteous only in his eyes, and I'm just blessed. I'm favored. That, that was it. Don't worship me. Don't pray to me. You're out of your mind. She would be disgusted by it if she knew what was going on today by our Catholic friends. Just like the Holy Spirit is disgusted by people who keep on associating to him every Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, thought process and feeling that they have. Oh, it's the Spirit. Stop lying. Stop it. It's so offensive to him. No wonder he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Yeah, no joke. Don't grieve him. Stop breaking his heart. Stop making up stories because it makes you feel good. It's just so ignorant. In verse 14 of John 16, he will glorify me because he will take of mine and declare it to you. Notice how he doesn't take from your brain cells. He doesn't take from your thoughts. He doesn't take from your feelings. You see that? You see how the, you see how the, the, the church sanity lies about that? Oh, he, Holy Spirit, he's alive in my feelings and my emotions and my experiences. Well, that's not what Scripture says he does. Scripture says in John 16, verse 14, that he will glorify Christ and he takes of Christ and declares it to us. Not takes from me and you. He doesn't take from my thoughts, my experiences. He doesn't take from my emotions. He takes from what Christ says in his word. Interesting to me. I just... I guess all Pentecostal friends are lying. Yes, they are. All things the Father that has our mind, on account of this I said, that out of mine he takes and will declare to you. Straightforward. Full stop. So within this, I can just remind you that the Holy Spirit, again, going back to Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he is noted as the promise of the Father. So go to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. He assembled them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus said to them, charge them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. So, Holy Spirit is known as the voice of the Lord. He's known as the Spirit of truth. Spirit of the truth, I should say, excuse me. Spirit of the truth, meaning the Spirit comes out from, alongside Para, the Father, who comes out from the Father, the God the, God, the Father's Spirit from the Father, through Christ, the Father sends him, and Christ also can say he sends him. We saw that in Scripture. He's called the helper, the parakletos. He's our advocate. He speaks for us to the righteous judge, the mediator, Christ himself. He convicts us, reproves us, and, 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 and corrects us from our sin, our need to be righteous, sanctified, our need for understanding there's a judgment of accountability for how we live. He leads us and guides us. He does all this from taking of his own? Nope. From taking of our thoughts? Nope. Taking exclusively, 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 and only from the Scripture. He testifies of the living word using only the Scripture. Not your thoughts and your feelings and your experiences. That's lies. 
So then he goes in and says not only that, but now he's called the promise of the Father in Acts 1-4. He's the promise. He's the, he's the announced declaration. That's what promise means. He's the announced declaration. That's pretty awesome. So think about this. So when the power of the Holy Spirit, which is in verse 8 of Acts 1, Acts 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power, power, having come by the Holy Spirit coming upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the remotest parts of the earth. So he says that you'll receive power on the Holy Spirit. Understand that the presence of the Holy Spirit was given to them back in John 21. Let's go back to that real quick. In John 21, or John 20, excuse me. In John 20 and verse 21. So in John 20 and verse 21 and 22, Jesus is now resurrected from the dead. It's on Resurrection Sunday. It's now Resurrection Monday because it's now after 6 p.m. It's at nighttime. The women are the only ones who saw him first, plus Cleopas on the road to Emmaus. He's the only man that saw him was Cleopas in the Resurrection Sunday. The women saw him in the morning. Cleopas and his wife saw him later in the day. And then the apostles didn't see him at all until the following day, which is started at 6 p.m. Sunday night. So at 6 p.m. Sunday night, we're at verse 21 of John 20. And then Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 22. Having said this, he breathed on them and says to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. There's the presence of the Holy Spirit which makes me go, wait a second, whoa, 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 whoa. So when he was teaching, when they were following him for three years, the presence of the Holy Spirit was within Christ, but he wasn't on them. Do you see what's happening here? So in the post-resurrection statement Jesus is making, he's now and he's redoing what happened in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, they were enrobed with the Spirit of Christ, excuse me, with the Holy Spirit, excuse me, they enrobed with the Holy Spirit, and they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that's why God said, in dying, you shall die. When the spirit died within, the spirit without also left. And that's how they were naked and ashamed, but naked and not ashamed before, because they were covered with God's glory. Then they were naked and ashamed, same statement, but they were naked, excuse me, and now they were ashamed, because they lost God's glory on them. So Jesus first restores the ability for the Holy Spirit to be enrobed upon them. Unlike in the Old Testament, where he would come and go, he was enrobing them with the presence of the Holy Spirit different from the Old Testament that he would never leave. Let's go back to uh, that statement again when he says, receive the Holy Spirit. So I want you to go back to John chapter 15. Let me show you something here. So in John chapter 15, oh, is it John 15 or John 14 here? Let me see in a second here. No, it's in John 14, excuse me. In John 14, In John 14, he talks about the Holy Spirit. In John 14, and these are things that we get confused about. So, in the book of Acts, he tells you that await the promise of the Father. In verse 4, in verse 8, chapter 1, he's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. Earlier to that, earlier to that, a month plus before that, Jesus breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. So his presence was on them, never to leave them. How do I know that? Because in John 14, in verse 12, he said, Indeed, I assure you, he believing into me, the works which I shall he do also, and greater than these shall he do, because I am going to the Father. Now, people think that the he do means that we do greater works than Christ. And that's a Pentecostal ignorant thing to think, because Jesus made it very clear in the chapter right before this that no, mas no servant greater than his master, when he washed the apostles' feet, he would be totally contradicting his statement that we're not greater than the master that makes no sense he's talking about the greater and the number here is in the number word here is for quantity and the holy spirit's the one doing the work in quantity he'll do greater works than christ did because in quantity he will now not just dwell in christ but dwell in all of these believers these 12 apostles plus those who emanate out of them of course by attrition by the number of people and by the length of years that they're going to live to be more number of works greater than Christ would do. Duh. But no. No. We'll leave it up to Satan 
and pious mankind to go, no, I'm greater works than Jesus. Really? Really? How's that going for you? How's that pride and arrogance going for you? You're going to do greater works than Jesus. God Almighty, the creation that you are, you're going to do greater works than him. Do you sleep well? Because you must be having a screw loose up here. You got something wrong. There's nothing you could ever do and be that's greater than God. You're out your mind. Come on, man. It's common sense. And that's why he says later on in verse 17, well, verse 16, excuse me, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. You see, Jesus was a helper, and the word Allah was there for another. An additional. In other words, Jesus is also a parakletos. Interesting. So Jesus is calling himself a parakletos. But he, going back to what this is, the point was, this is kind of plays on the whole symmetry of the written word testifies of the living word. Jesus' is teaching and preaching he gave was only to be understood when the Holy Spirit later came around and expounded upon it. That's why Jesus says, I'm a parakletos, I'm alongside you, no doubt about it. I'm physically able to be hugged and embraced, and you hear me, you see my eyes, you can, you can feel my, my warm spirit of love and truth, and my, my sweet embrace, and when I'm gone, you don't have that physical anymore presence, right? But you do have the spirit, he's another helper. He's another parakletos, different. He's dwelling inside you all the time. And he's there to also expound on what I've already taught to remind you of. And so he says this in verse 16. He says, and he'll be with you into the age. In other words, he's not going to leave you like ever. Yes. Oh, you kidding me? That's okay. Well, it's, it's, it's what he's talking about is everything the Holy Spirit has done and is doing through the works of the apostles. In other words, when Jesus spoke, Jesus wrote the Word of God. Jesus spoke the Word of God. He is the Word of God, living Word of God. He spoke the Word of God, God the Son. Jesus lived, died, and rose again from the dead. The Holy Spirit then moved men to write the entire New Testament. Twenty-seven books were written. Did Christ write them? No, he did not. Did Christ directly speak to the apostles about what they wrote about? The apostle Paul, yes. Peter, no. No. James, no. Uh -uh. John, Revelation, some of it, yeah, sure. You say he's in the Spirit, not directly, indirectly, yeah, sure. But so the Holy Spirit is responsible for the moving into man's mind, heart, and spirit because now they're spiritually alive and he taught them and he told them what to write. The Holy Spirit told them what to write. As, as, as Peter said, moved as the Spirit moved us. The Spirit is the one responsible for writing down the teachings of Christ from these men's hands through what we call Scripture. Yes. And then also you got all the works that the apostles also were doing. And the book of Acts, all the things that they did. And the book of Acts, uh, with the beginning of things that then multiplied through, remember, there's two sets of apostles, the, the apostles that Jesus called, and then Barnabas and Silas, others were also called apostles, because apostles were, were the apostles were appointed by Christ. Other apostles were appointed by the apostles, and that's it. And the apostleship office was gone after that. That's it. Either you're appointed by Christ directly or the apostles directly. And since both of them have lived and died and rose up to the heavens, they're not here anymore. There's no more apostles. That's a done thing. You're done. Just like people in this gender war, I'm not going to call you a he when you're a she, and I'm also not going to call you an apostle when you're, you're associating something to yourself that's not true. I'm not going to do it. I'll call your brother or sister, I'm not going to call you apostle. I'm certainly not going to call you reverend either. I don't care what you say. I'm not calling you reverend, and I'm not calling you apostle. Ever not happening. I don't care what your title of your business card says or what your placard on your, on your building says. I'm not using those words because you're, you're, that's sacrilegious and it's wrong. So, so that being said, the whole reality going back to John 14, he says that another helper will come to you. So Jesus is the parakletos. There's another helper in the Holy Spirit. He's the parakletos. But he's going to be with them into the age, with us to the age. But he said with them specifically, the, the apostles. He's going to be with them into the age. So, then 
with them and through the age, which speaks to we can participate in this as well. Look in verse 17. The spirit of the truth, the spirit of the truth, which the world cannot receive because it beholds not nor knows not, but knows because, because, but you know it because he, I said it, but I should say he, he abides with you and will be in you. Look at the left side of your margin. Because with you, it says meaning. That means remains. The word abides is different. It means to dwell within and, and to ongoingly have as a possession. That's not what it says here. He's not our possession. He's a deposit of the promise of the Father. Interesting, the word used is meaning, which means remains. Remains is a volitional thing that he does. He's remaining with us. Because that's the promise that Jesus said for him to be and do for us, to be with us into the age. So whoever is alive, he's with us till you die. He's not going to leave you. You can grieve him, but he won't leave you. Yes. Is not say again, babe. Sorry. Is not the what? I can't. I can't hear your last. Is not the what? Human man. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he, so he's here saying he remains in us. He remains with us and in us. So you see that he, he re, he's with you and remains in you. He says, and the verse seventeen, left side of your margin. He's going to be with you, and, he re, and he's going to mini or remain in you. He will be ongoing. So there's your evidence of those who say, well, Holy Spirit comes and goes inside you. No, he doesn't. He's remaining in us. We don't abide. He doesn't abide with us as a, a, a constant ongoing possession that we own him. No, 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 no. He's choosing to remain in us because he is choosing to be subjected to the truth of the statement of fact that Jesus said that he would always be our parakletos. He'll be the other helper. He will not leave us orphans. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. There you go. So you have this comment there that the Holy Spirit's with us all the time. He remains with us. So his presence is in us. He will never leave us until the age. Notice he said nothing about the power of the Holy Spirit back in John 14. No mention of it. He mentioned no power of the Holy Spirit in John 20 when he breathed on them. Did he? No. No, no mention of it. Then you go to Acts chapter 1. It's the first time he mentions this power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't mention the power of the Holy Spirit at all. And the verses we just read about in John 14, 15, and 16, he mentioned him being a helper, having greater works, and, and being another helper, being a parakletos. Yeah, spirit of the truth, convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, leads us, guides us, teaches us, reminds us. It's all fantastic. Advocate for us. It's awesome. It's great. Any mention of that, him having power? Hmm? No. Then all of a sudden in Acts chapter 1, for the first time we see in verse 8, but you shall receive power having the Holy Spirit. Interesting. So they're going to receive power, him coming upon them. Then you go to Acts chapter 2, when it actually happens, verse 1, and when the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all one mind in the same place, and suddenly, remember the 120 in that room, and suddenly there came a sound from the heavens, like a violent wind rushing, and it filled the whole house, and they were sitting, while they were sitting. And divided tongues appeared to, to them like fire, and one rested on each one of them. And they were all filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak one in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Interesting. So the power of the Holy Spirit came to them, and immediately one of the evidences of the power of the Holy Spirit, which our Pentecostal friends take and bastardize, is that all of a sudden you can go, that's not what happened. So just please, just stop. What happened was they were talking like I'm talking right now and their language. They're talking Aramaic. They're speaking whatever language that they spoke, which more than likely was Aramaic. They're speaking that or Hebraic. They're speaking that. And all of a sudden, other folks from different areas, how do I know this? When you go back and you read in verse 8 of Acts 2, how do we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? And what he's talking about there in verse 8 of chapter 2 of, of Acts, he's talking about not only the language, but the dialect. 
For example, in English, there's a southern draw. There's also a northeastern by the Haba, by the Winder in Alabama, right? And, and California. Hey, man, what's up, dude? Everybody talks English differently. But it's all English, right? We have different dialects, we call it. So language and dialect is different. So language is what, you're, is what you're speaking, but how you speak it is your dialect. And what they were speaking of was their Aramaic or Hebraic. And not only was it their language and their dialect, there was multiple languages out there with various dialects, and they all heard it in their own language in that exact dialect. Why is that important enough? Because the power of the Holy Spirit had to do with doing something miraculous that is beyond just understanding the Word of God. The power of the Holy Spirit had to do with evidencing in and through your life God working uniquely in and on you differently than He does everybody else who believes in Him because the power of the Holy Spirit is associated with Him as He was with Daniel, giving you skilled wisdom and, and, a, and an excellent wisdom and an excellent spirit. Remember that from last week's study of the book of Daniel, chapter 5? The power of the Holy Spirit has to do with Him giving you a more excellent wisdom, a more excellent spirit. So the power of the Holy Spirit is not to everyone. Understand that. We talked about that way long ago. We did the story of the book of Acts, the study of the book of Acts. The power of the Holy Spirit is unique to understanding mysteries and secrets. The power of the Holy Spirit is unique to God manifesting in your life something that's unique and distinct to show everybody else. Not everybody who believes in me can do that, can they? Not everybody who has believed in me did I do that through them, did I? They're like, well, no, exactly. So why did they do that? to show you that he has a unique hand on those people's lives as he dwells with Daniel. Many people were of God, but Daniel had skilled wisdom and, his, and, and he had an excellent wisdom and excellent spirit, as God said. I didn't write that. God said that. We saw that last week in the book of Daniel chapter 5. So this is what's going on in the book of Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, is the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, was to give those followers of his a uniqueness of distinction of how he was manifested in their life. Not just his presence on them, but the power within them to illuminate God's word. So with that being said, I want to continue to, to let you see if I wrote it on the board. Let me see what else I wrote. Okay, now, so let's go now. I want to show you some things in the book of Corinthians. As we continue to see more of the person and work of the Holy Spirit, you have to understand there's a lot more in the book of Acts we could go through. I, I can tell you, well, let's go, that's not Corinthians. Let's go to the book of Acts instead. I'll go to the Acts. Let's stay in Acts. I'll stay in Acts for a little bit here. So let's go to the book of Acts and look, look in chapter 2. Look in chapter 2 when he says, And Peter said to them in verse 38, Reform and let each of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. Now people always there in my Church of Christ friends try to teach that immersion is baptism, which is true, and therefore it's be baptized to be saved, which is false. And they use this verse as their camp out verse. They ignore the two verses before it, when in verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel certainly know. Who's the audience? Are you dumb? No offense, but stop. It's Israel. It's not everybody in the whole planet. It's Israel, not Gentiles. So what are they, why is that important? Because they're reforming, they're repenting, they're turning away from their rejection of him as Messiah to believe in him as Messiah. That's the repentance he's talking about. Not this change of heart, change of mind. No, 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 no talking to the Jewish people who already heard the truth and rejected it. He's not talking about repenting from your sins. No. Repenting from your decision to reject him as the Messiah. He even said so in verse 36. I mean, I don't know what the problem is with you, you can't comprehend and reading fundamental. Verse 36 tells you that. They reject him as Lord and Messiah. So get, get real. So in verse 38, when he's talking about re, 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 repent or reform, maybe immerse, name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is talking about once you're in Christ, the Dorion, which is the word for gift, is Dorion, and the word Dorion is a form of the word gift that means a, gra a gift of gratitude. It's graciously given. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It's graciously given. It's given. It's given as a evidence that God said to you that you will not be left orphans that once you have a trust in him and a belief in him as your Messiah, that he will have a deposit in your life that you have the Holy Spirit who's now going to, again, teach you, remind you, lead you, convict you. Testify of Christ. Not take from his own. Take from what Christ said. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the gratuitous gift. It's the God. God gives this gift freely. 
once there's a trust and belief or belief in Christ as your Messiah. Then as you go on also, you see in the book of Acts continuously other verses like this. Go to uh, verse chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 31, you'll see. And while they were praying in verse 31, the, house, the, the, the place was shaken and they were all assembled and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke with the word of God with freedom. And the word freedom there is in the plural. Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, different from having the presence of the Holy Spirit, again, His presence is not meaning you're filled with Him. Not true. Our Pentecostal friends try to make you think that word filled means you speak in tongues and do this miraculous thing. Not true. The fact that you're filled with Him means that you will be able to speak the word of God with all freedoms. Meaning, the evidence that you're filled with the Holy Spirit means that you have all freedoms, plural, to open the word of God up and then explain whatever things mean, understand them the way God means them to mean. That's what he's talking about. You have the freedom to understand God's word without construction, without restrictions of your human frailty, without the depravity of your ignorance. So if you, you know when you're filled with God's spirit, you know how you know? When you read scripture and, and, you, and you, can, you can read multiple scriptures and it's clear to you what they mean. You didn't, that's not me making that aware to you. That's not you making that aware to you. That's God doing that. God says, if you can go to any, if you can hear me clearly for what I'm saying, you can understand what I mean, understand how it all connects together, then you have freedom to understand my word because I filled you with my spirit to understand that. That's what God's saying to you. So do all believers in Christ have the filling of the Holy Spirit? No. No, they do not. They all have the presence of the Holy Spirit. He remains in them. Doesn't mean they're filled with him. No, 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 no. Because if they are, if they say, I'm filled, okay, prove it to me. Go to scriptures and, and, and show me the freedoms, plural, that you have to just understand everything God has to say with, you know, I'm not saying you know everything, but I'm saying you have a, you have a freedom. There's, there's, a, there's a basis, there's a, there's a framework of freedom you have. And, and you're, not, you're not like confused or lost or, or confounded. You, you have this freedom that, that God can always show you. Whether you know it or not, God always seems to give you insight to what he means. God always tends to show you things. By the way, does the filling of the Holy Spirit last forever? No, it comes and goes. So does that mean you can always do that? No, but I'm saying at times you can do that. But it's not because of you. It's because of God. And that's what they were doing here. It's interesting to know this. People think that you're filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. No, you're not. First of all, not everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit. And even when you are, you don't sustain it. It comes and goes. Why? Because we're sinners. So that's Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Now go on even further and go into Acts. And it goes, let me see. I'll go into, uh, let's look into Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. You go here. In Acts chapter 8, when you go to this point where uh, verse 13, Simon also believed. This is the Simon the, the sorcerer. And of course, he was uh, in verse 13, house of belief, having been immersed, he was constantly attending to Philip and beholding the signs and great miracles which were performed. And he was astonished. Then Acts chapter 8, verse 14, the apostles in Jerusalem, having heard that Samaria had received had received the word of God sent to them Peter and John, who having come, having gone down, excuse me, gone down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it was not yet fallen any of them, but they had only been immersed into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now you look in the left side of your margin, they might receive the Holy Spirit because he's talking about to these people what they were having to have happen to them. They again believed in Christ he says in verse 14 they had already heard they had already heard that Samaria had received the word of God the word of the God now remember this the word of the God is similar to sporos so the sporos is the word of the God Luke 8 says that right and then you have Luke 8 sower in the seed the seed is the word of the God and within the word of the God is this is the sperma so remember the seed within a seed so there's a seed within the seed so Within, so there's the, there's, and, and within the word, the word of the God has the word of the Lord within it, within it, the keys to the kingdom, no, no pun intended, but ah, fun. So, so what you have here is you have the sporos, and inside of it is the sperma, like a peach seed. If you read a peach, again, going back to that, you crack it open, there's the seed in a seed. So when you see, we already know that within the sporos is the sperma, so that means that the word of God contains the mysteries and secrets. 
So when the Word of God is mentioned, it, it's, it's, it's mentioned in, in a general sense to speak to the knowledge of God's Word at its, at its rudimentary level, but it also, if you ongoingly are engaged in it, will lead you potentially to the secrets of God's Word, the mysteries, as Christ calls them. So therefore, when the Word of the Lord is being, uh, the Word of God is being spoken ongoingly, then it will lead you, as God wills, into the Word of the Lord, as He calls it, which is the teachings of the Lord, which is about the mysteries and secrets, and so you have this ideology here it's going on in in book of Acts chapter 8 Simon's trying to get like as you can see in verse 12 going back to verse 12 but when they lead Philip announcing the glad tidings concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Christ they were immersed both men and women see so he's teaching the kingdom and Simon is like going wait so the, he wants to buy as we know he's a he's a, 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 a jerk yes No, it his, it's right. It's a great way. It's a great word, activity. It's his. It, it's the. It's the. Ba it's basically his. His encumbered. His encumbered presence in our life. So sin encumbers him. Let's face it. Our sin is an encumbrance to him. That's why he says, "Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Don't break his heart. Don't let him down. All we have to do is get sin out of the way. Let him do his thing." His job is to convict us of sin, so he can't sin, plural, to lead us into righteousness so we can be accountable unto judgment. So he wants to help, to help us, to convict us, to then lead us and teach us and testify and remind us and all these things. So he is filling, is associated with our ability or collaborative nature of obeying him. So our job is to know him and serve him through obedience. The desire we have to know him and then serve him through obedience is commensurate with, by doing so, our putting off of of sins and by doing that where we get filled with the holy spirit by the determination of god himself that that itself does not equate to being filled that's the that's the premise from which we have to have to be in the position to be filled so we have to be in a place of knowing and serving and obeying obedience to god putting off our sin now we're in the position that we want to be filled we're emptied out of our sin now you're saying god fill us he may or may not fill us to different levels that he determines. He may fill us halfway, all the way. I don't know that. But you won't be filled at all unless you have a knowledge and attitude of wanting to serve and obey him and getting sin out of your life. Then when you do that, God says, now you're in a position for me to fill you. But he fills you to the level he determines, when he determines, for as long as he determines. That's the difference. That's what the filling means. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why when we get, I mean, think about it in your own life, we've all been there. There's parts in your life where you get there where you, you're you wanting to know and serve and, and, and obey God, and you're putting off unrighteousness, and there's different levels of moments. I can testify myself where you, God's filled me differently at different times when Scripture kind of comes alive. There's different moments where it's, it's more fluid than other moments. So I know that God didn't fill me as much, and that's okay. I'm not going to be mad about it. I'm just content I'm filled at all, at any time. I mean, I'm just amazed by it. Like, why even do that with me? I'm just a sinner. So, so in, in the book of Acts 8, they're talking about, again, them having, I've heard the, uh, the, in Samaria, they received the word of God, sent to them uh, Peter and John, and they, and they went down and prayed for them that received the Holy Spirit, meaning they were acclimating to believing in God's word, but they didn't yet, you know, again, have this trust in Christ through it. And the reality is they were hearing about the kingdom things. And so when they were hearing about the kingdom things back in verse 12, it was above their head. And so they heard that they were receiving not just the word of the, word of the God, but within it, Philip was, Philip was teaching the full gamut of God's word. He's teaching the rudimentary things, the mystery things. And they received that information. And they were like, whoa, that's a lot of information. <laughs> and so they were actually giving them uh, the Holy Spirit in the sense of letting them understand it all starts with a trust in Christ as Savior, as your Messiah. And so... There is a interesting piece here in verse 17 that says they placed hands on them and, and then they said, you know, receive the Holy Spirit. Because he said in verse 16, for he has not yet fallen on any of them, but they had not been immersed into the name of Lord Jesus. 
and they placed on them on hands and they received the Holy Spirit. And so when you see this, he says, and Simon saw it and said, I want the imposition of hands. And then they said in verse 19, he said, verse 19, saying, give me the authority that I may place my hands and may receive the Holy Spirit. And they said, no, Peter said, no. The silver, he said to him, may, that, may your silver go to destruction with you because you have sought or you have thought to buy the gift of God with money. And this particular gift, he's talking about receive the Holy Spirit. He doesn't mean just receive the Holy Spirit to have salvation in Christ. They received the word of God, meaning they wanted, they were trying to, uh, they were really wanting to understand these kingdom things. And so when they're receiving this gift from God, they're doing this. If you look on the uh, aspect of what he's talking about here, he wants them to actually have this word of God from the Holy Spirit being received to them. He wants them to be, immer- not just have the Holy Spirit in verse 15, but to have him fall upon them in verse 16 so that they could be immersed. And then when they're immersed, he placed hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit for the purpose of verse 12, them to understand the glad tidings of the kingdom that was being taught, not just to be in Christ. So this gift of the Holy Spirit they're talking about in verse 18, or verse 8, verse 15, and 16, and 17, is referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit that's essential for the foundation, that he grows on this presence within your life to give you the filling of the power in, that you would have to understand what's being taught. So they were receiving it like, I, wanna, I think this is, I want to hear more of this. But they can't understand this. They can't, they can't acclimate to it. So that's the Holy Spirit in their life having the need to teach and remind them of what it means and why it means what it means. So you go on also in the book of Acts continuously. And I can go to the book of Acts and say verse chapter 13. In chapter 13, you see an interesting um, phrasing here in chapter 13 when he says, we, and I've read this many times in my life, in ter- verses 47 and 48, he says, And the Gentiles, in verse 48 of Acts 13, having heard, they rejoiced and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many were disposed for Aeonian life believed. And that's speaking of, again, the Aeonian life, meaning of life for the age. And so the aspect of what they heard, uh, it was the word of the Lord, which was associated with the deeper things and mysteries and secrets within the word of God. So he's talking about those who heard the word of God within it being taught the word of the Lord, likened unto Acts chapter 8, those who believed the word of God and its deeper understanding of the word of the Lord, those who were disposed to understand that had life for the age. Because life for the age is only attainable for those who ongoingly walk in faith and who have an inheritance, obviously, in that age. And that only attainable through that process. So, and then you go on to verse 52 of that chapter, in chapter 13 of Acts. It says, disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So that's after they wiped the dust off their feet. So again, they don't let their emotions and mental state get the, get the best of them. Come back to what we were saying before, how you know you're filled. You have to separate your thoughts, your emotions, your experience. This is the exact opposite of what charismatic Pentecostal folks say. So you have to engage your, your mind, engage your thoughts, engage your emotions, engage your experiences. And then the Holy Spirit's filled with you. No, it's just the opposite. You, you cast that stuff off. They were being, basically, they're just, they cast it off, and this, they are filled with joy, and filled with the Holy Spirit, because they put God before their experiences, for their thoughts, and that's what the thing is. So then you go even further on, you go also in the book of Acts, and you go into chapter uh, 19. Go to chapter 19 of the book of Acts. Let me show you something here also in chapter 19 about the Holy Spirit. So they're here talking about the Holy Spirit in chapter 19, and it happened while Apollos was in Corinth, and, and, and Paul was having passed through the upper parts, came to Ephesus, and having found some disciples, he said to them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said to him, we have not heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said, into, the, into what then were you immersed? And they said to him, John's immersion, verse 4. Then Paul said, John immersed the immersion of Reformation, saying to the people that they should believe into him that was coming after him, that is, into Jesus. In verse 5, and they having heard this, they were immersed into the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul, putting his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, and they were all about 12 men. Now, were there Jewish people present? Yes. Because it says in the very next verse, enter the synagogue, and he spoke boldly for three months, for reasoning, reasoning, the persuading about the kingdom of the God. Keep reading here, and you go into uh, verse 9 and 10, this is where he first had his seminary, and when he and then some were hardened and disbelieved, speaking evil of the way, 
before the people having departed from them. He separated the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this was done for two years so that all the inhabitants of Asia heard the word of the Lord, again, the deeper knowledge of the word of God, both Jew and Greek. So going back to the earlier part of Acts 19, when he says that he laid hands on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, or excuse me, putting his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them, excuse me, came upon them, they actually had then began speaking in tongues and prophesying and all this. That's because it was evidence to everybody else compared to the John immersion that you're returning from your sins and trusting in the Messiah was not fully understood and he was giving them the understanding of the full counsel of God, which is what he talks about in the very couple of things after this, verses after this, teaching them in the school of Tyrannus, the word of the Lord. So receiving the Holy Spirit has to do with them trusting in Christ, returning to Christ is one thing, to, as the Messiah, but do you understand what that really means? Do you understand that means that what everything he taught is more dynamic than what it includes Jew and Gentile? There's an inheritance. Remember, he talked to people in a way that they didn't understand. It wasn't just about this by grace through faith message. It was, it was a message about the coming kingdom of Christ, the inheritance therein, Jews and Gentiles of the earthly and heavenly. All this was being spoken about in the dynamics of the book of Acts. And he proves that later on. And even also, for example, later on in the same chapter, he adds to this concept when, when this is going on. There's this one guy who says, I can cast out demons. And of course, they, they say, I know Paul, who are you? And they beat the guy up. And as you fast forward in Acts 19, go to verse um, 18, when the people see that Christ's name is magnified among Jews and Greeks. In verse 18, many of those who believed came confessing and declaring their deeds, Acts 19, 18. And many of those practicing magical arts brought together their books, burnt them before all, and they computed, they computed the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So in, in the context of that context of him putting on, on hands on them, the speaking in the tongues, they had the Holy Spirit, he said to come upon them. In this context, they've been teaching for two years, and later on they did it with their magic. In verse 20, thus the word of the Lord powerfully increased and prevailed powerfully now the word powerfully is associated with the word of the lord because it includes in reference the power of the holy spirit you cannot have the power of the word of the lord which is within the word of god made known to you unless the holy spirit by his power makes it aware to you and by having such a thing you now have a unique hand of god on your life from which he will continue to what he calls prevail which is the word for to be strengthened and fortified ongoing that's what he's talking about so as you continue to see this in the book of Acts, go over also to the first Corinthians, and I can show you about the Holy Spirit as well and his, and his role as we continue to see his, his role and function in our life. People like to say things different about him and what he can do, what he does not do, and how we control him. It's not true at all. He, can, he does what he wants to do. Yes. So the logos and the, so point, so the, logos and the rima is of each seed. So there's a logos and rima of sporos, there's a logos and rima of sperma. Yeah, this, okay, yeah, so the womb, that our life in the womb for nine months and our life now is akin to our life now versus the life in eternity. So yeah, and so therefore our life in the womb, we don't remember much, much in the same kind. We won't remember this life as much in contrast to eternity, correct. And, and the whole aspect of that's like a Logos and Rima situation where while you're living it, it feels like it's pretty deeply, you know, when you're in the womb, I guess as a baby, they, they say baby can definitely feel and have pain. I forget how many weeks in it is, but they, they have that, I think, like in the second trimester. They can start feeling that, like, wow. But at the same time, the people in our life, we think this is the, the end of it all. And yet, it's just a precursor of pilgrimage, like you mentioned. So it's like a, unto a logos, unto a deeper rima understanding. So, but there's a logos rima of sporos and logo rima of sperma. So depending on who you are in Christ, if you, all you know is sporos, you have the logos and rima demarcation if you're walking with Christ to see that from then and now. But then if you know the sperma like we do, then even, it is, it's even deeper appreciation of the now and versus the then, to your point. But he's talking about, and, and, and the Holy Spirit's aspect of these things, he's just, the presence of the Holy Spirit is to teach us the Word of God, is to teach us and to equip us and to remind us and to lead us 
and to the word of God, testifying of the living word of God, Jesus. And then when he has the power in you and the power of the Lord is now made manifest and prevails in you, that's because the Holy Spirit's filling you and you have the power of God manifested and his word is now manifesting inside you where you can now explode, if you will. It actually has empowered you to see, he has empowered you to see things that a man cannot on his own see. No human can just will himself to see the mysteries and secrets. God has to open that up to you. I, that's what God says in the book of Matthew. It's a privilege. But going back to the Holy Spirit again, he, in verse uh, 7 of, of 1 Corinthians 12, so 1 Corinthians 12, he tells us that, that uh, in verse 4, there are various and gracious gifts, but there's only one Spirit. There's one Spirit. And so, so he says in verse 7 that in each of us is given the manifestation or is the phenerosis, which is the disclosure of light. Each of us is given a disclosure of light. In other words, each of us is enlightened of the Spirit for the benefit of all. So the manifestation. So not just the manifestation, but the manifestation. So each of us, so the Holy Spirit, in other words, the common lie we hear today is we're all the same in Christ. Then, then how do you explain verse 7? When it says the manifestation, the manifestation, the phenerius, the light of his disclosing to us is unique to each one. That's interesting. Don't you think that's interesting? It says, each has given the manifestation of the Spirit of the, for the benefit of all. For the benefit of all. Then he talks about different ways in which he brings his light, which means that we're all not the same. We're all not the same. We understand there's bodies of Christ, there's eyes and ears and foot. People understand that, but they don't understand that also means that there's different levels of aptitude, capacity, abilities that God has given because of this. In verse 11, he even tells you more of this given over all those different things he gives but going to the heart of what the Holy Spirit does he says but in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 12 but all these things performs the one and same spirit watch this now distributing that means diaruon which is through a process of apportioning dividing to each in particular as he wills so he divvies up as he wills like you know when you when you're a pirate back in the day and you take a ship they go with the Let's go over the booty. What do we get? That's what they call it, the booty. What, are they, what did they get? What are their, what's, their, what's their right of claim? And they divide up all the gold. They divvy it up. But the captain says, I get more because I'm the captain. And then the first mate gets more. He divvies it up. Everybody, everybody doesn't get the same exact thing. The captain and whatnot always got 